Well, in Luke 9, 18 through 22, we come to a watershed moment in Luke's gospel. And in the training of the 12, as Jesus asks them the very well-known question, who do you say that I am? Now, this is really the point that Luke's gospel has been driving at so far. The identity of Jesus was the focal point of the birth narrative, where we come to the climax of that narrative with Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the temple. And as he's in the temple instructing the religious leaders and asking questions, they wonder at him, and they marvel at him, and they, they are amazed by his wisdom and his insight. His identity was the crux of the issue and his temptation with Satan in the desert. And you remember it all begins with his identity being questioned, if you are the Son of God. After his first sermon in Luke chapter 4, the synagogue wondered at who he was. They wondered at what he said, and they asked the question, is this not Joseph's son? Demons have confessed his true identity, and he has rebuked them and told them to be quiet. People wondered at who he was in Luke 5 as he forgave the sins of the paralytic. And they said, who is this who even forgives sins? In Luke 7, his identity was once again questioned, this time from an unlikely source, as John the Baptist sent messengers to Jesus to find out if he was really the Messiah or if they should look for someone else. Jesus clearly demonstrated to John and his messengers his messianic credentials and that they were impeccable. In Luke chapter 8, the disciples had to grapple with this question of Jesus' identity. You remember them out on the storm, tossed sea, and Jesus calms the storm and they're amazed and they're terrified and they say, who is this that even the winds and the water obey him? In Luke 9, we see this question has reached all the way up to the palace. In Luke 9, 7 through 9, we see that Herod himself is asking this question, who is Jesus? Is he John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? Is he one of the prophets? This question is the key question that Luke's gospel has been driving at. And in fact, if you could get in a time machine and travel back to about A.D. 29 and go to Galilee and they had tabloid magazines, this would be what was on the cover and the line at the supermarket. Who is Jesus? It's what everyone is talking about. From Herod on down to the lowest pauper. And one week, is Jesus John the Baptist? And then the next tabloid, is Jesus Elijah? You know, and they'd have all this evidence. And, and this is what they would be speculating on. This is what would be on the news. In the marketplace, this is the conversation. Who is Jesus? It probably would have been a hashtag on Twitter had they had social media back then. Who is Jesus? We come to the point now in Jesus' training of the 12 where it's time to see if they know the answer to this question. They've obviously been thinking about it. Everyone's been thinking about it. They've been discussing it. We know that as recently as Luke chapter 8, they did not know the answer to this question. They were amazed at him. They were not sure who he was. When we come to Luke 9, 18, they've been with Jesus for about uh, two and a half years now. They've had uh, quite a bit of training. They're, they're six months away from their uh, graduation ceremony. Jesus' death is about six months away. His resurrection is about six months away. They have had ample training. They have seen uh, a number of miracles. They've heard his gracious teaching. They have spent time with him in prayer. And now after all of this, two and a half years of, of the finest theological education that anyone has ever had, do they know the answer to this question, who is Jesus? Now, as we, come to un as we come to this section, we need to understand this is really the most important question that anyone can ask. It is the question of all questions. Who is Jesus Christ? People posit some big questions in our world today. What is the meaning of life? Where did we come from? Where are we going? How can we have joy? How can we have happiness? These questions are foundational questions. They're questions that everyone must consider. 
and that everyone does consider. Unless you've created so much noise in your life that you never have a moment of quiet, never a moment to think and reflect, which is possible in our culture today with the entertainment cycle that goes 24-7, but unless you have completely insulated yourself from your own thoughts, you must wrestle with these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is the point of this? Where am I going? What is going to happen to me in the future? What happens after I die? Where are my loved ones who have died? Is there justice in the world? Why is there suffering? Why is there evil? God made us to wrestle with these questions. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, it says that God has set eternity in our hearts so that we ask these kinds of questions. Uh, we're not like monkeys or, or apes or dogs that, that don't even understand the concept of tomorrow, let alone uh, eternity. God has put eternity in our, in our hearts, which causes us to ask big questions. Questions that pertain not only to ourselves and our tomorrow, but to our eternity. And we never find the answers within ourselves. And we never find the answers by our own reason. Ecclesiastes goes on to make this clear, God has made us to have thoughts that are about eternity, but He has also made it impossible for us to arrive at the answers from within ourselves or within the created universe. The answers to life's big questions are only possible to understand and to arrive at if we know the answer to life's biggest question, which is, who is Jesus Christ? The question that towers over all of these questions. Who is Jesus Christ is the question that explains the meaning of life. It is the question that explains where we came from. It is the question that explains where we are going. It is the question that explains how we can arrive at joy and happiness. It is the question that explains and answers why there is suffering in the world. It is the question that answers the question, will there be justice in the world? It is the question of all questions. It is the key that unlocks the map so that we can understand it and read it. It is the solution to the puzzle that God has put in our hearts that we ponder on, but we can never solve on our own. How we answer this question, who is Jesus Christ? will have temporal and eternal implications. It will determine how you live now. And it will determine your destiny for eternity when you die or when Jesus returns, whichever comes first. There is simply no greater question than this question that Jesus asks his disciples and by extension all who read this gospel. This is the question of all questions. Who do you say that I am, Jesus asked them. And Jesus asks us. I was doing some research this week on this question, and I saw a graphic someone had put together of this, and it, it said, you know, who do you say that I am underneath it? It said, Jesus is on trial, and you are the jury. Well, that is absolutely wrong. When Jesus asks this question of the disciples, he is not the one on trial. They are. He is putting them on trial. He is the judge, jury, and executioner. When we are asked this question, we are not determining Jesus' identity. We are determining our identity in relation to him. How we answer this question says something about us. It judges us. It says who we are in relation to the thrice holy God with whom we have to do and before whom we will stand and give an account one day. Therefore, getting this question right is of utmost importance. There is nothing you will wrestle with in your life that is so important to get right as the answer to this question, who do you say that I am? Throughout my educational career, I had to decide which schools to attend, important decisions at various stages of life. Some of you are in that stage, maybe you're in high school, maybe you're in college or graduate school and you're trying to figure out what to do next, where to go next, you have a lot of questions. Do you put more time and effort into those questions than you do answering this question? Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus Christ? We might wrestle with what career to have, where we should live, what house to buy. Some of you who are here today and are single might wonder who you ought to marry. 
if you ought to marry? That's an important question. It is absolutely insignificant and meaningless next to the question, who is Jesus Christ? We must get this right. You pick the wrong person to marry, well, you're stuck, but you know, probably only for 50 or 60 years, and then it's over. You answer the question, who is Jesus wrong? It's an eternity, an eternity. You must get this right. Time and eternity hang in the balance. Well, how do we get it right? Well, let's face it, at the outset, most people get it wrong. Most people get it wrong. Jesus said the road to destruction is broad and there are many there be that travel thereby. The road to life is narrow and few there be that find it. So how can we be sure that we have it right? How can we know we're on the narrow road? How can we be sure we're not going along with the throng of people partying their way down the broad road that leads to destruction? Two answers to that question. Two components of a proper confession of Christ. Now, let me say at the outset, these are at the broad level. I wrestled with whether or not to spend about ten weeks on this. But... (laughs) I decided we're going to move through Luke, and we'll come back and do a series on Christology, the doctrine of Christ, later. So we're only at the broad level here. This is very broad. There's a lot of detail we're not going to get into, but these are the guardrails that will keep you on the right road as you sort out uh, the details. These are the categories that set the parameters of your understanding. Number one, to hold a proper confession of Christ, we must abandon popular misconceptions. We must abandon popular misconceptions, verses 18 and 19. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. But others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. Now, the very first thing I want you to notice in these two verses is that Jesus begins with prayer. He begins with prayer, and it happened that while he was praying alone. This does not mean that Jesus was all alone. The disciples were obviously there since he asked them a question at the end of this prayer time. But what it means is that Jesus and the disciples are finally away from the crowds. Uh, They've been trying to get away from the crowd since Luke 8, if you remember. And finally, we get to verse 18 of chapter 9, and they are alone, and they are away from the crowds. It is just Jesus and the twelve having a rest, having some time for prayer, and to reflect and discuss all that Jesus has done in these two and a half years of ministry. Now, what's interesting about Luke's gospel is how much is between verse 17 and 18 that we don't find out. Uh, We just saw the feeding of the 5,000, and then Luke comes to this question, and there is a whole whole list of events that Luke just skips. Uh, You can read about them in Matthew 14.22 through Matthew 16.12, or Mark 6.45 through Mark 8.26. That's two chapters in Matthew and Mark that Luke just completely skips. Uh, Let me tell you some of the things that have happened in between. Jesus has walked on water. Jesus has healed a number of people. Jesus has given the bread of life discourse in John 6. Jesus has been in conflict with the Pharisees over religious traditions. Jesus has traveled northwest to Tyre and Sidon and ministered there. Jesus has traveled southeast to the Decapolis, this largely Gentile region, and he's ministered there where, by the way, he fed 4,000 men, not to mention women and children, so a crowd of fifteen to 20,000 people that he fed. He has healed a blind man on his return to Bethsaida. All of this has gone on between verse 17 and verse 18. It's not in Luke. Uh, Luke uh, is not interested in these particular events for his purpose. You can read about them in Matthew and Mark, as I said. You say, why did Luke not include them? Well, he had other things he wanted to talk about, other events uh, that we don't find other places, and he only has one scroll. And it's not like, you know, you can type on the computer and just keep going and going and going and going. He had to limit his information, so he, he doesn't cover these things. Uh, we see here that Luke is not copying Mark, as so many scholars think. He's not copying Matthew. He's writing his own gospel, and he's telling the story the way the Spirit has inspired him to tell it. Now, it's after all of this 
All of these events that Jesus and his disciples finally get alone and spend time in prayer, and Jesus, as he often does in Luke, is in prayer before a momentous decision. In fact, Luke includes this note because he wants us to see how important this is. This question, this moment. Jesus is about to ask the disciples the question of all questions. But before he does, he excuses himself for prayer. Now it seems most probable that Jesus is praying for them, for their understanding, for God to open their minds and their hearts to the truth of who he is. In fact, go back to Matthew 16 for a moment in the parallel account. Matthew 16, verse 17. Peter gives the right answer, which we'll look at in a moment in Luke's gospel. But Jesus replied to Peter, and Matthew says, And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus tells Peter, you didn't arrive at this by uh, education from some professor. You didn't arrive at this through some human process of logic or intuition or deduction. You understand this because God revealed it to you. That is why you understand it. This is not because you were smarter than the crowds. It's not because you were more educated than the crowds. It's not because you're more holy or worthy than the crowds or wiser than the crowds. It is simply because God in his free grace has shown you this truth. Now why does God do this? Well, he does this because Jesus has been praying. Jesus prays for the disciples. He prays that they would understand. And this note on prayer serves as a reminder that we do not and we cannot come to the truth on our own. We cannot get there by our own wisdom, our own reasoning. We only come to the truth by the revealing work of God the Father. And so Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for them because he knows the popular misconceptions about him and he wants them to abandon those misconceptions and to confess what one can only confess by the revelatory work of God, by God's gracious work in them. And so Jesus prays for them and after praying for them, he brings them a question, the first question of their two-part exam. And the question is in verse 18, who do the people, who do the crowds say that I am? Now Jesus here is not like uh, so many today in taking a survey. Uh, Jesus is not trying to adjust his ministry to figure out how he can better get information out to the crowd. That's not the point. Jesus knows exactly what the crowd thinks. Uh, He knows what they are saying. Uh, He doesn't need information from the disciples to to get that information. The reason he asked the disciples this is to set up a contrast. This is a teaching question. This is not Jesus asking questions to learn. Remember, Jesus doesn't ask questions to learn information. Jesus asks questions to teach information. And so Jesus here is giving the disciples an opportunity to consider all the options that are available to them to answer this question. He wants them to think through the issue. And so he says to them, who do the crowds say that I am? What is the popular opinion that you've heard? And they've heard a lot, right? Because they've been in Galilee, they've been to Jerusalem and back, they've been up to Tyre and Sidon, they've been over southeast to Decapolis, they've been to Bethsaida, they've been to Gennesaret, they have been all over the land. They have heard it all. And Jesus is now, after two and a half years of all of this, and hearing everybody from every part of the country, every corner of the, of the nation of Israel, and even a little bit beyond, what's the, what, are, what, is, what are people saying? What have you heard? And the disciples' answer comes in verse 19. They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. These are the three popular options. There's probably others. We read in one of the other Gospels that Jeremiah, the prophet, was a popular option as well. And so here's the top three answers that are on the board here, if it's a game of family feud and you're taking a survey. (laughs) Number one answer is John the Baptist. And then you've got Elijah, and then you've got uh, some prophet. Now, if these sound familiar, it's because these are the same options that Herod considered in verses 7 and 8. These are the the main ones. 
And the question comes up, why did the crowd think it was one of these things? Well, first of all, they knew that Jesus was doing and teaching things that went far beyond anything they'd ever seen or heard. They, they had no way to argue against the miracles. The miracles had been so frequent, they had been so powerful, they had been so mighty, there had been so many of them that there was no denying the miracles. They couldn't say, well, Jesus is, you know, he's just a, he's a, a trickster, he's a hypnotist, he's a magician, he's a, you know, he's out there, he's an illusionist. That wasn't going to fly. Too many people had seen it. Too many people had experienced it. Too many people had had loved ones brought back from the dead and said, let me tell you, he was not an illusionist. All right? My son was dead. My daughter was dead. There was nothing about this that was magic. They can't deny it. They can't get out of the power of Jesus. They had heard the teaching of Jesus. They had heard the authority of Jesus. There was no way they could say that, you know, Jesus is just out there borrowing authority and quoting rabbis and, and he's, he's secondhand knowledge. This was absolutely untrue. And they knew that it, was, it would have been a farce to have posited these kinds of answers to the question, who is Jesus? But the reason they come up with these things is because they have to come up with something. But their understanding is limited by their unbelief. They refuse to acknowledge the truth that is right before them. Their hard hearts lead them to concoct some kind of crazy explanation because they don't want to submit to the deity and the the messiahship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they come up with the best they can. John the Baptist, he had been mighty in word, uh, and he had been killed. So maybe he's come back from the dead. I mean, that seems rational, right? I mean, that, seems, that's ha- that happens all the time. And, and so this is one of the answers. John is back. He's do- endued with divine power. Elijah was a popular answer. You remember Elijah? He never died, right? One of t- only two people who's ever, who's, who never died. And Elijah, he was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And so they don't ever say that this is Elijah raised from the dead because they know the Bible well enough to know Elijah never died. So this isn't Elijah raised from the dead. This is Elijah coming back from heaven, riding back on his chariot of fire. Elijah was, uh, like Jesus, a miracle worker. He had fed people in in ways that made no sense to uh, the normal rules of uh, physics and grocery shopping. And, uh, And so Jesus' ministry was very similar to Elijah's in many respects. And the prophets had said Elijah would return before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And there was Messiah fever going on all over Israel. And here's a prophet, they think, like Jesus, who is like Elijah. And so maybe this is Elijah sent back from heaven. Others say, well, maybe not Elijah, but one of the other ancient prophets. We know all the other ancient prophets died, and so they have to posit that they've risen from the dead, unlike Elijah. Similar reasoning to John the Baptist. They're just going back further in time. But what they're acknowledging by saying these resurrections from the dead or these people coming back from heaven or or back from wherever Elijah went in their minds is something supernatural has happened. There is no natural explanation for this. Jesus' ministry is extraordinary. And you can't just ignore it. You can't explain it away with human logic and and human categories. You've got to come up with something out of this world. And so they concoct these things because they don't want to recognize him as the Son of God. Now, disciples give these answers, and, and the reason Jesus does them is to show them that they must abandon these popular misconceptions. None of these answers are right. None of them are even close to being right. They must reject the thinking of the masses. They must reject the thinking of the crowds if they would know Jesus and make a good confession of Jesus Christ. Now, today it's the same situation. There are many false Christs today. Many false understandings of Jesus. The masses today have have all of their explanations for Jesus' ministry. Uh, you, You might hear, well, Jesus was a good moral teacher. Like Gandhi and, and like Buddha and like, you know, whoever other, Hare Krishna, whoever other, you know, guru that people like. Jesus was a moral teacher. He was a, he was a good teacher. Or, or I've heard Jesus was a pacifist. Uh, you know, Jesus came to bring peace. He came to end war. He came to uh, do all those things. Of course, Jesus says he didn't come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. 
Jesus was someone who showed us how to live by his example. He was just a very righteous person who lived a, a life that was a good example. In fact, he's such a good example that he even was willing to die for what he believed in. Now, isn't that a good example? You should be willing to die for what you believe in. He was a martyr. Uh, he was a, uh, somebody who was a prophet who had a cause or, or somebody who believed something strongly who was a cause and got martyred for it. Uh, some people say Jesus was a deceiver. He was a liar. I've heard that Jesus was a social liberal, bringing a message of poverty relief and social programs to help the poor and the disenfranchised. Uh, Jesus came to unite us all in the brotherhood of humanity so that we could put aside our differences and, and really just love each other. Jesus came to make you happy. Jesus came to make you healthy. Jesus came to make you wealthy. Many people will say, Jesus is your buddy. Jesus is, you know, he, he's your friend who, who, who's just sort of there and, and he, he just likes to hang out with you. He just sort of wishes you'd spend more time with him. Jesus is the grandfather in the sky who's just wishing somebody would accept him. Anybody, somebody, please. The list goes on and on. Then you have people say Jesus never existed, the most ridiculous of all. I mean, irrational foolishness. And the reality is that if you would know Jesus, you must abandon all of these misconceptions. If you want to confess Jesus Christ, you must reject what the vast majority of the world accepts as the truth about Jesus Christ. The vast majority of the world falls into one of these categories that I've just read. And we must reject them. We must abandon popular misconceptions. But secondly, we must, on the positive side, assert biblical revelation. We must assert biblical revelation. To make and maintain a true confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must assert what the Bible says about Jesus, not what human reason comes to think about Jesus. And we see this in verses 20 through 22. Jesus begins with the contrast in verse 20, and he said to them, but... Who do you say that I am? You is emphatic. It's placed first and explicitly declared. It's not actually necessary to even write the word you in Greek in this particular instance, but it's put first and it's written out to show that Jesus is shifting the topic to them. Who do you, the disciples, let's talk about you for a minute. Who do you say that I am? You know what the crowds think. You know what the scholars think. You know what the kings think. You know what the Gentiles think. Now what do you think? What about you? Not surprisingly, Peter speaks up for the crowd, verse 20, and Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And evidently, all the other disciples nodded in agreement because we don't have any argument or discussion about it here. Peter is the spokesman for the group. And he nails the answer to this question with giving a clear statement identifying the person of Jesus Christ. He identifies the person of Jesus Christ. A proper confession of Jesus clearly articulates biblically who Jesus is. As Peter does in verse 20. You are the Christ of God. What does this mean? Well, the word Christ comes from a word that means anointing. Anointing, someone anointed by God for a specific task or a specific office. Priests in the Old Testament were anointed. Uh, most importantly, kings in the Old Testament were anointed by God to serve as the king of Israel. As time went on, the term Christ or Messiah was used of a, uh, a king partic uh, independent of any particular human agency or human anointing. The anointing was no longer considered to be with oil, but with the honor, power, and authority of God himself to exercise the authority and power of God on God's behalf on earth. And as, as they went on, they understood this idea of anointing, and the prophets prophesied about the Messiah, the expectation turned toward the future. When someone would arise from the house of David to bring the kingdom of God to earth, to defeat the enemies of God, to save God's people, and to bring them deliverance. Now, this was often conceived of in geopolitical terms of an earthly kingdom, overthrowing other earthly kingdoms. 
And so Peter's confession is that Jesus is this chosen instrument of God, anointed with God's power, anointed with God's authority to bring God's kingdom to earth and salvation from God to God's people. Jesus as the Christ then is the rightful king of Israel and indeed the ruler of the nations since the Davidic Messiah we read in the Psalms would rule the nations with a rod of iron. We see that Peter also says that Jesus is the Christ of God. He is not just the Messiah, but he is the Messiah of God. Now scholars are divided on what it means that he is of God. Uh, Does that mean that he belongs to God? He's God's Christ. Does it mean that he originated in God? Does it mean that he is anointed by God as the anointing is the agency? He is the anointed one who is anointed by God. Difficult to say just based on this verse alone, but if we go back to Matthew 16, 16, I think we get a better idea of what is going on here in Peter's confession. In Matthew 16, 16, we get the confession in full. Luke has abbreviated it. Matthew gives it to us in in its full uh, form. Simon Peter answered, verse 16, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so you can see that Luke has abbreviated just to say the Christ of God. He's taken out a few words for the sake of space. The idea here, then, is Peter says that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This phrase, of God, then, ascribes divinity to Jesus Christ. It means that Jesus is not mortal. He is not merely a human person, but he is a divine person. Now, it it would be anachronistic to say that Peter had understood all the details of the Trinity at this point. I don't think he's worked all of that out in his mind when he makes this confession. But what he is saying is that Jesus is the Son of God. He is a divine person. He is deity in bodily form. This confession of Jesus' person, then, is nothing less than to note that he is the human king descended from the line of David with the divine right to rule Israel and all the nations. And furthermore, he is divine as he is of God, related to God as the Son of God, the Son of the Father. Now, we have to be clear about this. All true confessions of Jesus Christ contain both of these elements— He is the human descendant of David, very human, 100% fully man. And he is of God. He originates from God. He is sent from God. He is very God of God. He is a person who is not a mortal human being, but an immortal human being. He is God made flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. All true confessions of Jesus Christ assert the deity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must do no less. We must assert divine biblical revelation and not succumb to the ignorant opinions of the crowds. Second, though, we must also understand not only the person of Christ, but the work of Christ. The work of Christ. And Jesus unfolds this for Peter in verses 21 and 22. We have a stern warning in verse 21, notice, but he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone. Now that's quite the opposite of what will happen at the end when he tells them to go and preach the gospel everywhere. But for now, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Why? Well, because knowing that Jesus is the Messiah is not enough. You need to know what kind of Messiah he is. You need to know the work of Jesus as much as you know the person of Jesus. And the crowds did not understand this. They had no comprehension of it. The disciples, in fact, at this point, did not understand the work of the Messiah. They knew Jesus was the Messiah. They knew he was divine. But they did not grasp all the implications of this. And Jesus did not need the crowds whipped up into a political frenzy, trying to make him king again, as if they could make him king when God had made him king. But it would have been a severe misunderstanding of the Messiah for him to rule then and not later, after achieving victory through his sufferings. And so Jesus goes on to explain to them, don't say anything to anybody about this. Keep it to yourself. And here's why, because I need to suffer, I need to die, and I need to be raised. You need to understand not just who I am, but what I've done. Verse 22, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Jesus breaks his work down into four basic parts. He must suffer many things. 
That's a reference to all the things that Jesus suffered leading up to his arrest. A lot of times we picture the suffering of Christ as him dying on the cross, and truly he did suffer there. He bore the wrath of God for the sins of everyone who would ever believe for all of history. But Jesus' suffering did not begin at the cross. Jesus' suffering began really at the incarnation. He suffered many things. He was tormented in his soul by the wickedness that he saw around him. If, if righteous Lot was tormented by Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah were more likely to repent if they had been around than Capernaum, think of how wicked they must have been. And Jesus' righteous soul is suffering, tormented day after day as sinners reject him over and over, mock him, ridicule him, scorn him, call him demon-possessed. Jesus would suffer many things. And then once he had suffered many things, it says he would be rejected by the Jews. He was a man of sorrow, acquainted with griefs, and then he is rejected, a rejected man. The leadership of the Jewish nation stands in the place of the entire nation here. He would be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, the three ruling classes of the Jews. The political, the religious, and the lay leadership of the nation. They would reject their own Messiah. The idea here of rejection is, uh, is the idea that they would examine him. They would put him on trial and they would examine him in detail. And after examining him, they would conclude, we don't want this man to reign over us. They would put Jesus on trial and on the basis of their trial, their farce of a trial, they would reject him. And then it says, Jesus says that he would be killed Notice the sensitivity of Jesus here. The disciples probably couldn't take much more detail than this at this point. He doesn't tell them about the cross here. He doesn't tell them about the crucifixion, the scourgings, and all of these things that would take place. He just, he, he, he sort of wraps it up in, in a little bit of a softer uh, package. I'm going to be killed. The details we'll worry about later. But, but what you need to know for now is that the Messiah is going to be killed Now, this is key because for the Jews, a dead Messiah is a failed Messiah. A dead Messiah is a useless Messiah. A dead Messiah is a fraud, a fake, a phony Messiah. So here Jesus tells them in advance that he would die. In fact, this is uh, often what they did to dispel the Messianic movements as they watch and see what happens when the Messianic leader dies. And then the movement falls apart because the leader has gone. Dead Messiah is a false Messiah, is a meaningless Messiah, insignificant Messiah. And so Jesus says, look, it's going to look like failure. It's going to look like I'm a fraud. It's going to look like I'm a sham. It's going to look like my ministry has been meaningless. It's going to look like it's all over. But then notice he says at the end, and be raised up on the third day. A very specific prediction of his resurrection. He says, my failure will be overturned by triumph through resurrection on the third day. God would raise Jesus from the dead. This is a divine passive. He would be raised up on the third day by his father. Uh, this is all predicted by Jesus before any of it happens. The Jews would reject Jesus, but God would accept him. And God would prove that he accepted him by raising him from the dead on the third day. The sacrifice of Christ would be sufficient for the sins of his people. It would achieve the salvation of those for whom he died. It proves that he is not a failed Messiah because he is not a dead Messiah, but he is a living Messiah who rose and who lives. Now the disciples understand that Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus wants them to understand what kind of Messiah he is. He is a Messiah who suffers, a rejected Messiah, a Messiah who dies, a Messiah who fails to meet every human expectation of what a Messiah should be, but a Messiah who meets the divine expectation and the biblical expectation of what the Messiah would be and who would overturn his defeat with victory through resurrection from the dead. Before the cross must come the crown. I'm sorry, reverse that. Before the crown must come the cross. And the disciples needed to know this. They needed to understand Jesus was going to fail their expectations because their expectations were for a political Messiah. Notice that Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer many things. Must, must, must. Underline it, highlight it, draw a circle around it. Must. 
This is the word, the must of divine necessity. This is not the Son of Man will suffer many things. This is the Son of Man must suffer. He must die. He must be rejected. He must be raised. Why? Because this is the divine plan and it must take place the way God has determined it would take place. He came for the purpose of suffering. He came to be rejected. He came to die and He came to be raised and it must happen that way. You ask, why must it happen that way? For our salvation. Because Jesus came to save sinners from the penalty and the power of sin through his blood and righteousness. And there is no salvation unless these things happen. So these things must happen. God has determined it would be so. Psalm 118.22 says, The stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. The word rejected there is the same word in verse 22 of Luke 9 for rejected. Jesus would be rejected because he is the chief cornerstone and because God had determined that his son would be rejected by sinners and die. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of the Lord, you can read about it later, who bears the sin of many and justifies many by bearing away their iniquities. These things were predicted in the Scriptures. These things, in fact, were determined before the creation of the world that Jesus would suffer and die and pay the penalty for sin. The suffering and rejection and death of the Son of God was the plan and counsel of God from eternity past. And now Jesus steps into history, into time and space, and the plan must be fulfilled. Note, there is no plan B. There is no plan B. These things must happen. There are no other options. This is not chance. This is not bad luck. This is not uh, Jesus coming and, and offering one thing and it not working out. And so I guess we'll go with plan B and we'll die. No. This is the reason why he came. This is the plan. The plan is the rejection of the Messiah, the death of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah. The, de- the rejection of Jesus, note this, was not the rejection of God's plan. The rejection of Jesus was the fulfillment of God's plan. Jesus is the rightful king of Israel and he is the ruler of the nations. He is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity and he came to be rejected, to suffer, to die for sinners and his work was successful despite the mocking and rejection of the world and we know he was successful because he was raised from the dead. Now the question this morning is, is this the Jesus you confess? That's the question. Is this the Jesus you know? Not the Jesus of popular opinion. Not the Jesus, the social reformer. Not the Jesus, the good teacher. Not Jesus, the example. Not Jesus, the martyr. Not Jesus, the one who came to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Not Jesus, uh, your good buddy. Not Jesus, the social revolutionary but Jesus, who is the Christ of God, who came and who had to be suffering, rejected, killed, and by God raised on the third day. This is Jesus. And the question is, who do you say that He is? This is not putting Jesus on trial because I have told you from the Scriptures who He is, but the way you answer this question puts you on trial. Who do you say that he is? This is our Jesus. This is our God. Let's pray together.